Uh, I'm Jeremy Dean, Director of Education at Hypothesis, and you are at the Annotation and Education Summit at OLC Innovate, hashtag annotate dead, annotated, um, which you are free to use. Uh, we encourage you to use if you're tweeting uh, during the sessions here uh, or during the session. Um, there's a bit.ly link at the bottom of this slide deck that you can uh, access the slide deck uh, yourself if you want to have it in front of you. Uh, there are some resources within that might be useful later. We can also tweet it out and share it um, later as well. <clears throat> this is an overview of our agenda. I, I sent it out beforehand, but we're going to spend about the first hour or so uh, just with a general introduction, um, an introductory activity so we get to know each other. Um, and then Manuel Espinosa is going to give a mini keynote to um, set the tone, set an inspirational tone for our uh, afternoon together. And then the second hour will be annotation stories for many of you in the room that have used Hypothesis and other tools uh, in the classroom. Um, and then the third part will be a design thinking activity led by Remy Kalir. Uh, we are uh, broadcasting this session as a webinar for some virtual folks. Um, so just be aware of that. I think we have a mic that will wander around if folks out at those tables, you know, have something to say, it'd be nice to, to have the mic so the virtual folks uh, can hear you. And for those that are joining us virtually, uh, we are going to sort of cut off our feed uh, at around three o'clock when we're done with the annotation stories, um, because the activity will be sort of not really translate into the, into the webinar. Um, all right, let's get started. I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about the Hypothesis Project uh, since we brought you guys together and annotation generally, um, and then we'll, we'll play with the Legos that are on your table. Uh, so don't touch them yet. Don't look at them. They're for later. So we're here to talk about annotation, which is really uh, nothing new. It's an age-old uh, technology that's been employed by scholars and students since at least uh, the invention of a book. I'm a former English professor by training, and I would always hand out Billy Collins' marginalia, first day of every term, to try to inspire my students to write physically uh, in their physical books, um, to aid their comprehension, and to start developing the kind of critical thinking that um, I was hoping they would, you know, was really one of the major outcomes for my, uh, for my course. Uh, in, in 2017, in February 2017, the governing body of the internet, um, the W3C, recommended web standard, re recommended annotation as a web standard, uh, which basically made uh, annotation a part of the infrastructure of the web. So this skill that I've been trying to teach students uh, in my English courses of, of close reading and critical thinking through marginal note taking and commentary uh, was something that is now built into, baked into uh, the physical structure of the internet as an open and interoperable uh, standard. And there are real radical consequences to this that, that we'll talk about. Um, one of them is that it allows these layers of annotation. Let's see if I can get everything up. Yeah, all right. Uh, allows layers of annotation to exist on top of anything that's on the web. So any website, article, ebook, document, or piece of multimedia can have these multiple layers of note taking and conversation on top of them. I can have a private note layer on top of a document online. I can uh, see public notes and, and comments uh, online on, a, on the same document. I can make a reading group for colleagues that are interested in this topic and, and gather them all on this uh, space, whether they're you know, at the same school or in the same city or remote or working uh, asynchronously. Um, and I can, of course, develop private course groups for annotation as well, all on top of a single document. So I can see multiple layers of notes and comments on top of a single document uh, online. My colleague John Udell likes, has a great way of describing this. He says that you know, if the web is an information fabric, then annotation increases the thread count of that fabric. Because the way the standard is designed is that every annotation has its own URL, its own way to point to it on the internet. So if before we've trafficked in web pages on the level of a document, now we can exchange and engage with information online on the level of comments and threads of conversation. Hypothesis is a nonprofit, uh, so our goal is to bring annotation to the internet. We were a big part of the ratification of those standards by the W3C. Um, and the radical idea behind Hypothesis as a nonprofit and open source software company uh, is that this layer of commentary on top of the web that takes place in the margins and annotation can't be proprietary. 
can't be owned by a single company. It needs to be owned and, uh, by, by the people who create the content and allow people to choose which tools they use as, as long as interoperable annotations could be read by different tools. Um, and so it gives more power to the user in this model than um, a for-profit venture capital proprietary model would. I always like to give a little shout out to our team. My colleague Nate Angel is in the room and will be uh, engaging uh, directly with y'all later. Um, but we have a really great small team. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful group of people that are really dedicated to this, to this mission. Uh, many of whom, especially in the developers, could be making more money elsewhere but join a nonprofit outfit because they really believe uh, in the mission as something that's healthy uh, for, for tech and for, for the internet. So of course, as I mentioned before, you know, annotation is not something new to education. And in talking to users, uh, end users, uh, you know, students and teachers, I've isolated sort of three ways that I think that annotation uh, is powerful uh, in the classroom. And these are really just uh, the beginning of the conversation. Folks uh, in the room are gonna tell their own stories about using annotation and bring up other points and takeaways from, from their experiences. But for me, there's three things I want you to sort of think about as a starting point. And then Manuel is gonna kind of throw it all out the window because I think he's, using, he's doing more radical things than, than what I'm describing here. Um, but first is that annotation makes reading visible. When I would assign, when I would read Marginalian and tell my students to write in the margins of their books, that was really just an aspirational thing. I never, I never taught them how to write in the books. I never taught them how to highlight. I never taught them what to write. I mean, I might give them some suggestions about technique there, but really it was just a hope they would go and do it and that it would make them better comprehend what they were reading and become critical thinkers. And then I would assess a paper or some other uh, summative assessment that was supposed to sort of display those skills, um, that, you know, the, the outcomes or the, the benefits of those skills. Um, but hypothesis and collaborative annotation, social annotation makes reading visible in powerful ways. For one, you can know that your students have read rather than assigning a PDF and, and hoping that it happens and kind of staring into their eyes and, and seeing, you know, trying to magically understand if they had done the, the reading or not. You can actually see evidence of this, but you can also see how they're reading and start to engage with them and, and talk to them about how they're reading, uh, intervene if they're confused about something, inspire if they get off on some train of thought that's incredibly valuable that you want to push them on. You can uh, reply to an annotation and, and be there with them while they're reading. This is also not something new. reading makes, uh, you know, hypothesis makes reading active. I think this is the essential component of, of uh, annotation generally in its analog form as well. But it's important to remember that as we start to deliver more and more of our readings online, uh, we lose the, the analog you know, tools of annotation. We brought an analog tool for you, the little post-it notes or sticky notes that are on the table to take away some swag, but you can't use a highlighter online. You can't use a pen, there's you no know, sticky notes. So tools like Hypothesis bring that active reading process uh, to, to digital content. And then finally, and I think most radically, annotation makes reading social. I think education professors and Ramey and, and Manuel can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, knowledge production is understood as a social process, right? It takes place uh, in community. But a lot of times the way we teach reading is something that's a sort of isolated activity. And I think it's important for people to curl up with a book on a couch and you know, fall in love with, with a text. So that we're not trying to get rid of that. But ultimately, reading is a social activity bringing those ideas to a conversation, engaging, building up other people's ideas, and hypothesis makes that possible. Um, I'll just lastly emphasize that, you know, unlike I think a lot of the tools that you would see in the vendor hall here, Hypothesis is not a typical ed tech company. Um, we have a browser extension that can be downloaded by anybody in this room or anybody in the public and be used for free to close read as a citizen <laughs> of the internet um, and to engage with others as a citizen of the internet and there's lots of professions and everyday folks that are using hypothesis that have no association with universities. And I think it's a powerful thing to introduce some, uh, a tool to students that will, they can take with them um, beyond the classroom and beyond a campus. I've used my 10 minutes, so I'm gonna skip my roadmap stuff and we're gonna play with Legos to try to keep us on time. Um, all right, so we're gonna play with Legos. There's Legos on the table. Um, there's a fewer people than uh, were expected, so there's lots of Legos for everybody. Um, and here's the basic idea. You're gonna find a partner at your table, and you're gonna introduce, or next, you know, adjacent table, and you're gonna introduce yourselves to each other. Um, and as that person is talking um, and, and telling you a little bit about themselves, 
your job is to assemble a Lego figurine for your, uh, the person that you've just been introduced to. Um, you have, each table has, I think, 12 or 13 Lego figures on it. Um, so that's 12 or 15 legs, 12 or, or 13 torsos, 12 or 13 heads. Apparently, men Lego, male Legos do not have hair. It's not a thing for, for male Legos. So <laughs> Manuel and, and Remy have proven that to be true in real life as well. Um, but, but, and then there's 12 or 13 accessories. So each figure can have torso, legs, head, maybe hair or helmet. I don't know if that's the sort of hair of a man or something like that, but, um, and accessories. Um, you, they are, the Legos are built, but you can take them apart. Um, so you may want to mix and match, gender bend. There's enough if you want to put two pants on. You can't put two hats on a leg, but you could put two pants. So when you say, well, because people say I wear many hats, but in this case, you might wear many pants. Um, just trying to help, you know, get the creative juices flowing here. Uh, for those of us that are working, uh, that are virtual, there is a link in this document, and Nate, I think, is probably tweeting it out um, or putting it in the chat where there's a virtual way to create a figure. Um, so I'm gonna let you guys go ahead uh, and, and start talking to a partner and interview them and create their Lego figurine.